20 years ago, Japanese automaker Toyota was a very different beast to the firm we see today. It was a company which was quickly becoming one of the world leaders in clean vehicle technology. Four years prior, it had launched its first generation Prius sedan in its home market of Japan, and it was well into a program that would bring the very first Toyota RAV4 EV to the world. Depending on whom you listen to, the original Prius was either Toyota's reaction sometime in the early 90s to hybrid vehicle prototypes being developed in Europe and North America in the late 80s and early 90s, or it was a desire of Toyota's CEO and leadership team at the time to develop a global car, codenamed G21, that would herald in a brave new century. And the latter? It was a response to various pressures, including from the state of California, which wanted automakers to develop and build all electric vehicles to tackle the state's horrendous air quality and push California towards a cleaner, greener future. Regardless of this, 2001 was a time where Toyota was very much at the cutting edge of alternative fueled vehicles. It made one of two commercially available hybrids and it made one of a handful of limited production available EVs. If I could have taken a 2001 U and transported you 20 years into the future, armed with the knowledge of what Toyota was doing as a brand and the direction it was headed in at the time, and then I told you how electric vehicles have finally started to take off, and explain how governments around the world had begun to lay out plans to ban and phase out the sales of new internal combustion engine vehicles sometime between the next five and 15 years, I would expect that you would think Toyota to be one of the companies leading the charge. But as those of us with the last 20 years intact in our memories know, that's not the case. The Toyota of 20 years ago has morphed into a company that first leant heavily towards hybrid vehicles, in preference to EVs, then towards hydrogen fuel cell vehicles and hybrids, turning its corporate dismissal of battery electric vehicles into what almost feels like some kind of perverse pastime. Its television ads have gone from actively promoting hybrids and yes, even electric cars, to portraying electric vehicles in a very negative light, making them the butt of jokes in ads for both Lexus and Toyota, and coming up with ad campaign slogans like self-charging hybrid for its hybrid vehicles, which not only confuses car buyers into thinking that hybrid cars are electric cars, but also actively dissuades people from buying a battery electric vehicle. Side note, if you missed the bit in Toyota's history where it actually promoted electric cars, Check out the weird little RAV4 EV ad I'll link to below, with a very young, fresh from Jurassic Park, Jeff Goldblum providing the voiceover. This journey that Toyota has gone through has seen it focus almost exclusively on hydrogen fuel cell vehicles in recent years. It made a big budget Back to the Future themed series just for the launch of the original Toyota Mirai. It set up fuel cell cars as the automotive future it wants. That is, despite the state of California, one of a handful of places in the US where you can actually lease or buy a hydrogen fuel cell car, falling woefully behind on its promised global rollout of hydrogen fueling infrastructure. And for the past few weeks, as part of a series of congressional hearings, Toyota executives have been arguing to elected officials as to why the US government shouldn't be so enthusiastic about the future of EVs, and why forcing car companies to go all electric would be bad news for consumers. Yep, that's right. While most other automakers are finally coming around to the idea that they are probably likely going to have to cease manufacturing internal combustion engine vehicles, and are taking appropriate steps to heavily invest in and develop battery electric and some hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, Toyota still seems stuck at the fingers in the ears pretending it's not happening stage. So how did Toyota get to this point? Why is it so anti-EV? And why does it keep getting things wrong? but occasionally getting things right. 
about electric vehicles. Before I dive into the reasons, which I think are partly institutional, partly down to a change in leadership at the company, and partly cultural, as well as some other things, let's start with last week, where Robert Wimmer, Director of Energy and Environmental Research at Toyota North America, told a Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee hearing that, quote, if we are to make dramatic progress in electrification, it will require overcoming tremendous challenges, including refueling infrastructure, battery availability, consumer acceptance, and affordability. As Royce has reported, Wimmer went on to state that 2% of vehicles sold in the US last year were actually battery electric and that it took Toyota 20 years to sell more than 4 million hybrids in the US. The implications of this are, of course, that people don't want hybrids, let alone battery electrics. That narrative is one that's certainly familiar to anyone who has been in the EV world for any length of time. In fact, it was a narrative that was until recently shared by most, if not all, other auto industry executives. Name an automaker and it is likely at some point in the last few years some executive or engineer or other has trotted out the same talking points and misconceptions that Toyota is still relying on. The difference, of course, is that most automakers have now come around, and for good reason. While hydrogen fuel cell technology always sounds good on paper, you can refuel far more quickly than a battery electric vehicle, and you don't have to worry about special parking where you can actually refuel. The real world is very different. Hydrogen fuel cell cars are often a lot heavier than battery electric cars. They're often not quite as perky, their fuel tanks take up a lot of space, and the hydrogen refueling infrastructure has proven extremely challenging and expensive to deploy. In fact, you can install a whole host of rapid charging infrastructure for the cost of a single hydrogen filling station. And that's before we even tackle the inefficiencies of hydrogen fuel cell cars, the problems with generating it in an environmentally friendly way. Electrolysis to make hydrogen is more common than it once was, but most commercial hydrogen today still comes from the steam reforming of natural gas, which is of course a fossil fuel. But who am I kidding? I suspect I am preaching to the metaphorical choir, so why don't we change track? Let's see why Toyota has the attitude it does towards EVs. First, I want to examine the change in leadership at the company. Like every firm, leaders come and go, and Toyota is no exception. In fact, since the original Toyota Prius was first teased in 1995, Toyota's leadership has undergone several presidents and CEOs. And as I'm hoping to detail in a new video on this channel in the near future, the direction a company takes is very much tied to the personal opinions of its leadership. The change in direction we've seen from General Motors and Volkswagen in recent years, I'd wager, is as much tied to its changes in leadership team as it is anything else. And it does run both ways. At Nissan, former CEO Carlos Ghosn was very much into an all-electric future, but his replacement? Not so much. And it really shows. Toyota CEO Akito Toyoda is a car fanatic, and he has driven competitively. He's always been less interested in eco-minded transportation solutions, certainly less than his two previous predecessors, the elder of which, Fujio Cho, counted development on environmentally friendly vehicles as one of his best accomplishments at the company. It was he, by the way, who spearheaded the original development of the Toyota Prius sedan back in the 1990s. Just like many companies, the CEO set the entire tone of the company. And even though Toyota is working on electric vehicles, there are in fact several planned for the Chinese market and some planned for Europe and North America, it's obvious that Toyota would rather continue its work on hydrogen fuel cell vehicles and hybrid vehicles. Why is this? I think it's got to do with return on investment. It took Toyota more than a decade to make a profit from its hybrid drivetrain technology investment. If memory serves, it was 2010 or 2011 or thereabouts when the initial investment it made way back in the early 90s on prototype Priuses actually paid off. 
Toyota knows it can continue to meet at least some of the emissions requirements with its hybrid drivetrain technology and would, I'm guessing, much rather continue to reap those rewards than invest a whole lot of money from scratch into EV tech. And remember, the last time Toyota directly invested in electric vehicles was the turn of the last century, because Toyota didn't actually engineer the battery pack and drivetrain in its second generation RAV4 EV, Tesla did. And so when it comes to battery technology, Toyota is still generally relying on nickel metal hydride battery packs rather than lithium iron. A few vehicles do use lithium iron, but nickel metal hydride is still very much at the heart of Toyota's hybrid world. Investing in lithium iron tech now could potentially be viewed by Toyota as pointless, especially with next generation batteries on the way, which, come to think of it, might explain why Toyota is spending a whole hunk of cash on investing in solid state battery technology, since it believes that to be the next big thing in batteries, as well as being something that it believes will do away with all of the perceived problems it thinks lithium iron cells have. But there's also saving face. In recent years, most of Toyota's investment dollars have gone into hydrogen fuel cell technology. And right now, I'd also wager that it's sitting on a large amount of R&D debt that it hasn't reaped the rewards from. I suspect for Toyota to abandon hydrogen fuel cells now would be a cause of great embarrassment and massive financial burden. And right now it doesn't appear to believe it needs to, despite the challenges that hydrogen fuel cell vehicles face. Then we have the issue of Toyota's home market, Japan. Since the devastating earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear event of March 2011, Japan has turned its back on nuclear power plants for obvious reasons. It's shifted its electrical grid backwards in some ways, in fact, bringing older, more polluted powering stations back online. And so for battery electric vehicles in Japan at least, arguments over just how green an electric car is might be less clear-cut than they are elsewhere in the world. Additionally, since electric cars rely on a source of power, often the local grid, to fuel, since many Japanese citizens live in multifamily units rather than single detached homes, hydrogen is often perceived as having a better suitability to emergency preparedness. I know that's not necessarily true in other parts of the world, but I think this context does explain why Toyota has the attitude it does. Is that attitude correct? In my opinion, no. Toyota's attitude towards electric vehicles is built on age-old stereotypes and misgivings. So let's look at sales percentages. Yes, total global electric vehicle sales are a fraction of the overall market, but some of that is chicken versus egg. While the Tesla loyal would like you to believe that the Model 3 is an affordable car and that everyone can or should be able to buy one, the reality, frankly, is that right now the majority of electric cars on the market today are well above the price point of new car buyers, and in fact, many used car buyers. And this note about affordability is one point where Toyota is partially correct. Electric cars are still too expensive for many car buyers, forcing automakers to only make electric cars and other zero tailpipe emission vehicles of a similar price could theoretically drive car ownership out of the affordability range for many everyday consumers. But what Toyota fails to note here is that the cost of battery packs per kilowatt hour have dramatically fallen in the last decade, and they're roughly in line with how energy density of battery packs is increasing. This has, for now, resulted in electric cars which aren't a whole lot cheaper than they were 10 years ago, but cars which are far more capable and can travel far further per charge. And since Tesla, Volkswagen and GM all say they have plans to more than half the effective cost of kilowatt hour of battery capacity through cell improvements, economies of scale and new innovative construction techniques, I think the cost of EVs will plummet over the next decade. And when that happens, those EVs are expected to become much more affordable, just in time to make affordable battery packs for the equivalent of a Toyota Camry of EVs, which is frankly what we all really need right now. This massive drop in battery pack pricing will certainly help increase sales, as will the massive investments currently being spent on electric vehicle charging infrastructure for long distance trips. But again, 
What Toyota fails to acknowledge is the simple fact that for those who have access to off-street parking and charging, they are likely going to usually refuel their vehicles overnight from the grid in their home, while the grid is producing excess electricity and demand for that grid is low. Add in smart grid connectivity and most concerns about grid resilience go away because if we assume that most cars are driven no more than about 30 miles a day, which is about right, that represents a tiny percentage of recharging requirements every night compared to the actual theoretical total capacity of an EV's battery pack. Finally, I want to address statements made about the adoption rates of hybrids in the United States. While Toyota is correct with its figures for hybrid uptake, it's important to acknowledge that electric car adoption growth rates at the end of 2012, two years after modern plug-ins became commercially available, were more than two times the hybrid car adoption growth rate two years after the market launch of hybrid cars in the late 1990s. Today, that EV growth curve, which frankly looks pretty exponential to me, is significantly steeper than the hybrid growth curve after a similar period of time. And we've hit 1.6 million EV sales. We hit it halfway through 2019, just eight and a half months after series production EVs started to go on sale. And no, I'm not counting the original Tesla Roadster as it was an expensive limited run vehicle. Finally, while hybrid vehicles have peaked in their sales popularity sometime around 2012, EV sales are continuing to rise. You only have to look at the sales figures for last year, even during a global pandemic, to see that EV sales continue to rise while other vehicle sales fell. In short then, Toyota's assertions on why governments shouldn't ban internal combustion engine vehicles are built on misinformation outdated statistics, urban myths, and what I'm going to call institutional prejudice. If I had to guess, I think Toyota would rather not admit it was wrong about hydrogen fuel cells and EVs, and I think it's partly to blame for the attitude we're seeing today. It is developing electric cars, and I suspect if it's forced to do so, it will make very competent EVs. After all, that is Toyota's way. And with the US executive branch now under pressure from US lawmakers to name the specific date from which internal combustion engine vehicle sales will be banned, I don't think Toyota's going to win this one. And frankly, I'm okay with that. That's it for today. As always, thanks to the folks on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month Patreon supporters. Special thanks to our $50 a month Patreons. That's Ray Jean Fellows, Gordon C, Paul Conway, Laura Sandborn, Anthony Coates, Sean Ueda, and Tesla in the Gong. And our deepest gratitude to our amazing $100 a month Patreon supporters. They are John Lyons, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, JP Fagerback, Will Graylin, and Ian, you can join all of these amazing Patreon supporters just by following the links below. You'll also find a link to send us a tip through Ko-fi or Bitcoin if you would prefer to support us in that way. And there's also a link to our Discord chat server, which is completely free to join. So if you want to give that a go and you're feeling chatty, please do. And as usual, you'll find everything from t-shirts to face masks, hoodies, water bottles, and more at our Redbubble store. Thanks for joining me, and as always, keep evolving!